behind me is a tree, that one that's got that beautiful fork in it, just where the sun is starting to come up in the background. And that tree is a leadwood, which we will get into a little bit later, but it's one of the combritums. Um, but the reason why we've stopped here first thing this morning is because last night we had a female leopard, or what we call a leopardess, up the tree, and she was right at the top, and moving around, coming down, going back up, and a little bit later on we noticed that towards the left hand side there was a male leopard lying in the grass. So we're not too sure what was going on. Uh, she looked quite keen to mate, she was also calling, and um, as soon as he walked off this way, back into the thickets, she came down the tree and incessantly searched for him. All right. Female leopards are the ones that always instigate mating, um, and they kind of chase down the males. They kind of pester them until the male gives in to a little bit of mating. So we're back in the area this morning. We're hoping that we can find you some mating leopards. It's been a while since I saw mating leopards, uh, so I would like to find them too. Um, for me. <laughs> but good morning everybody. This is Tundra to the Sofa Safari and uh, let's find some spotted things today. So I managed to get um, Brit away from her coffee mug, her travel mug um, and off the vehicle so we can have a look at some leopard tracks. Um, as I said last night we did have those leopards that were just over in this direction now. So we were just coming down this road to see if they'd crossed. And uh, true as Bob they have. So we've got at least one walking here down the road. And it looks like a hyena coming back up the road. Now the hyena tracks I'll start with, you can see they are a bit more uh, fresh. You can actually see the soil's being disturbed and the hyena was maybe moving with a little bit of speed because of all that pushback there that's going on. Whereas the leopard tracks, if you look at that there, you can see that's quite smooth now. It's it's not that fresh. It was some time last night, um, just walking down the road. And there's a pretty good example of what we call a direct register. Although this would be an indirect. It looks like the leopard was moving a bit quicker. Uh, you know, when leopards are mating, the, the female, as I say, tends to pester the male um, to a point where he can get, either get quite aggressive or he puts distance between himself and her and then she tries to catch up. It's actually quite a cute thing to watch. Um, but generally speaking, the way leopards walk is something called direct registering, where by the, where the first foot lands, the back foot will land exactly on top of that part there, or, or on top of that track. So when you see this sort of overstep there, you know that the leopard was moving a little bit quicker. All right, so you've got the front foot there, which is always bigger, more round, like that. And you've got the back foot over here, which is usually more square, or some people want to say oval. Right, so round and oval. And the reason why animals have much bigger front feet, I mean, if you look at your own hands, and remember, our feet were once hands too, if we go back to our, our primate ancestors. But if you look at your own hands, your front hands are very round, very big, and that's because we used to walk like that, take a lot of the pressure, all those heavy organs, your lungs, your heart, your head, your big shoulders. Um, whereas the back feet are usually there just to prop up the much lighter back end. And so you end up with this much bigger pad at the front to take that weight. All right, and that's how you can tell if you're looking at a front foot, very nice and round, very big, or a back foot, very elongated, and nowhere near as round and as beautiful. Um, but yeah, telltale sign of a leopard, maybe, Brit, if I can ask you to step one step back and look here, um, is, or of a cat at least, and it might be a little bit tricky to see. Uh, I might need a stick that's a little bit um, tougher. But uh, otherwise, I'll just use my finger. But let me see if I can find something. Yeah, that'll do. Okay. So with leopard tracks or lion tracks or even your kitty cat home at, at home, you can see that the back pad comes round like that. You get one lobe and then a second lobe, a smaller one, and then a third lobe coming round. And then the foot continues like that. All right. So cats have three lobes at the back. One, two, three. Whereas dogs have just two lobes at the back. So that's one two and then back up all right hyenas which is just over here that you can see has this very small back pad which is there and it only has two lobes to it all right however hyenas are not a dog they're also not a cat they're somewhere in between and if you want to get really pedantic about things hyenas are actually more closely related to the cats than they are to the dogs but they form their own family called hyena day whereas the cats are from the feline family and the dogs are from the canine family. 
Anyway, let's stop wasting time. Let's see if we can find these little leopards still moving about. If they are mating, they shouldn't have gone too far if she's managed to claim her prize. Uh, as I say, the leopardess chases the leopard down when she wants to mate. Usually you find that's the other way around uh, with most animals when it comes to mating. So yeah, walk straight down the road. You can see the tracks going all the way around the bend there. So let's follow up. So I have just very cautiously walked into the thicket down into the riverbed and see if I could find the leopard tracks maybe coming up the riverbed because somewhere along the line they came off the road and uh, down towards this side so but no luck there was some lion tracks down there but it did feel a little bit like Vietnam so um, <laughs> I had a look around went around the bend followed the lion tracks a little bit hoping to find the secondary den um, but it is just a little bit too dodgy down there so I've come back up. We're going to carry on going uh, south. Um, excuse me while I get bitten by something. And see if we can pick up on the leopards still moving about. They haven't made any noise yet. So hopefully they did actually link up. Hopefully, hopefully she uh, got him to come around. But let's carry on. While we are looking for either our leopards or our lions, um, we've happened upon beautiful scene of a golden orb spider busy repairing her web pretty fascinating to watch I mean they take a lot of damage if you can imagine these big webs that hang between trees all it takes is a, a sneaky impala running through the scene or maybe a strong bit of wind um, and we did also have a bit of rain a couple of nights ago so that probably damaged a lot of their webs so yeah she's just taking the nice early morning light and uh, repairing and making ready her web to catch innocent bugs once again. Tree time. So, I've got a tree in front of us here. I'm going to get a few leaves for you all. Um, it's unfortunate that you can't touch and feel these leaves with me, but I'm going to bring them nice and close for you. Let you have a close look at that. That one's maybe a little bit scraggly. Let's find a good specimen for you all. Now, hold on, there we go. That's the one. All right, so you can see this tree makes use of quite an interesting leaf structure. All right, this is one leaf over there. It's called a bipinnately compound leaf. So you can see it separates once, like that, and then it separates again, like that. All right, this is a tree or a, a scheme that a lot of trees in Africa have come up with. It's an adaptation for dealing with heat and dealing with the conditions that we have in South Africa. And so when it gets a little bit too hot, you know, around midday, it can push 40 degrees Celsius around you, if not more, you know, maybe a little bit less. But when it hits those temperatures, trees that have this kind of leaf structure have the capability of just sort of closing those up. And you can see that this one is already sort of closing up um, its leaves a bit. But that's probably because I've just pulled the leaf off the tree um, so yeah when it starts getting too hot too bright the tree just closes up protects itself from being burnt um, or from losing a bit too much uh, fluid through evaporation or transpiration and uh, yeah that's how it does as soon as it cools down again these things all start to open up again so that they can receive sunlight and photosynthesize all right um, but it's an interesting tree it's called an African wattle it used to be called a weeping wattle which made a little bit more sense to my mind and that's because it is one of the weeping trees or one of the rain trees um, now there's two variants of rain trees that you get and this one belongs to the spittle bug variant so in other words these leaves get a little bug called a spittle bug that will come and sit on the bottom and it taps into the leaf and it drinks from the leaf but of course everything that consumes something has to excrete something and so when you have like an infestation <clears throat> of spittle bugs on these trees you can actually on occasion audibly hear the tree dripping raining and you can see it from time to time when there's thousands of these spittle bugs all over so hence a rain tree it forms its own rain other trees will also you know they, they're also rain trees but they don't get the spittle bug they just produce a lot of sap and that tends to leak out and drip by itself but this one is a spittle bug uh, variant all right however um, the reason I've stopped and the reason why I wanted you guys to be able to feel this and it is just quite soft hopefully my hand playing through there gives you some indication of how soft it is and when I start to bunch them together for you like this and just roll it up into a nice ball you get your African toilet paper all right so we lovingly refer to this tree as the toilet paper tree um, very nice and soft it doesn't have any um, sort of uh, it's not like poison ivy it doesn't leak anything it doesn't have any um, I'm forgetting the word 
but you get what I'm talking about. And uh, it also doesn't have any thorns. However, you do have to be careful because in Africa, there's a lot of trees that have, uh, as I say, that have uh, created these bipinately compound leaves. And um, a lot of them have thorns, whether they're the long white ones that are easily noticeable or if they're the little hook thorns that um, are not easily noticeable. So please, if you do find yourself running out of toilet paper, please inspect these leaves. Make sure there's no little thorns on there. Um, it will not be a very pleasant ending. Um, to your bush escape so yeah just watch out for that uh, trees like the acacias um, will have little thorns like that but also have uh, or some of the acacias at least will have um, leaves like this with little thorns now of course I'm saying acacia and for those of you that are into trees and really appreciate trees you'll know that Africa no longer houses the acacia family unfortunately because of the way taxonomical breakdowns work um, the acacias have been cornered off by the Australians so if you are Australia or Australian um, you know thanks for stealing our acacias the most famous tree species in Africa is now only found in Australia and our acacia family has been split into two derivatives called Vachelia and Senegalesis um, so yeah we have two different families now that used to be one acacia uh, if you get into the science of it it makes sense but you know we're still a little bit hurt by that so Thanks, Australia, for stealing our caches. We have happened upon the tallest animal in the world, the giraffe. And uh, this is a female. She's busy getting herself some breakfast. Watch how she just strips a branch of its leaves. There you go. A whole bunch in one go. Uh, and the way that I can tell that this is a female from this distance is uh, by looking at those horns. You can see the horns on top of her head. They're quite small, they're dainty, they're ladylike. The males have far more robust horns and they also tend to be bald at the top. So what I usually say to people is males' horns look like two little fists sticking up. Females' horns look like two little paintbrushes sticking up or like a makeup brush, a shaving brush for the gentleman. So we just came around the bend and there's a nice male giraffe here. So let's see if we can uh, get it to hold still for us for a couple of seconds and then I can show you the difference between the horns of the female and the male. You can see from here just his head sticking up there and you can see the horns. So remember what I said a bit earlier the males have those quite bald but also very robust horns whereas the females have those kind of paintbrushy horns. So there you go you can see the difference and the, ma the reason why the males have those thick robust horns and that are bald at the top is because they tend to fight with them in a process called necking where males just simply swing their heads at each other um, for a while you know just to try and knock each other out knock each other down they often knock themselves out but that's why they have those thick powerful horns good afternoon everybody welcome back i am driving this vehicle very irresponsibly but that's how we do things when we run and gun um this afternoon we wanted to get out again to try and work a little bit harder at finding those leopards for all of you uh, we still really want to see them so we're not going to give up just like that uh, but before we do that we're going to wait for the sun to go down a little bit get a bit cooler uh, but I'm first going to introduce you to a couple of new characters uh, that are in the area and uh, I look forward to introducing you. So stick around and let's see what else happens. It's our lucky day guys. We have happened across or upon a couple of very rare, very endangered crowned hornbills and I think this is the first time that uh, you've seen them on one of my drives. I know Chad saw them, Dale saw them. So quite nice that I can also introduce them to you. They are a remarkable bird that is um, revered in these areas and are loved in these areas. And whenever we see them or people see them, they're quite a spectacle. They're a lot of fun to spend time with uh, just because of the way that they kind of maraud around the bush looking for snacks here and there, eating snakes, small tortoises. If you remember that sheep Botswana we saw the other day. Uh, uh... Relish something like that. So yeah, always a pleasure to see them and they are somewhat of a conservation success story with their numbers over the last few years going from 300 all the way up to 1300 within South Africa and that's due to some very, very clever conservationists working very hard and tirelessly, tirelessly to uh, help the species. Wonderful to just listen to this young elephant bull chewing his food, enjoying his lunch. And if one thing that life is too short for, it's stopping for elephants. 
way too short to not stop for them. So whenever you come across an elephant, no matter how many you've seen, how many times you've seen them, always stop and appreciate them. As I say, when life gives you elephants, you look at them. They truly are a remarkable creature, particularly when you have them just all to yourself like this and it's nice and quiet, you can actually hear him feeding, chewing, breaking vegetation off with his trunk and uh, you can even hear the ears flapping. Now those ears will flap at a pretty constant rate at this time of day. It's quite warm today. Not particularly hot. But uh, elephants' ears, the reason why they're so big is because it's basically a radiator. So it's helping the elephant stay cool. If you have a look carefully, you'll see that there is uh, veins and arteries and just blood capillaries running all throughout those ears. And in the grand scheme of things, as thick as an elephant's skin is, its ear skin is very, very thin. And what that allows is the elephant, it allows the elephant to pump the blood through the ears on a constant basis throughout the day. And as that blood pumps through the ears, it's hot, it's warm blood, goes through the ears. He then flaps his ears, rushing them through the cooler air, and that helps to cool down the blood. That blood then pumps back through the body and it helps to maintain the elephant's core temperature. It's a very well thought out um, adaptation. It's also one of the reasons why elephants in Africa have bigger ears than the elephants in Asia. Or at least that's what I think. <laughs> My theory is that Asian elephants, although they deal with a hot environment, they also have a lot more shade to enjoy. Whereas African elephants deal with not only a hot environment, but a very shadeless environment in comparison. So Asia's got a lot of jungles, rainforests, things like that, whereas Africa has savanna grasslands and our trees are nowhere near as big and as lush as where you would find Asian elephants. So yeah, makes sense. Asian elephants, are, their ears are much smaller than an African elephant. And for those of you that are a little bit more interested in this, I actually wrote a piece on the Tundatula website on our blog on how animals keep cool in Africa. It's one of my favorite themes to talk about when it comes to animals. And I think it is just a great way to examine evolution and how things have come to adapt to this quite harsh environment. Right guys, so here they are. This is the six characters that I wanted to introduce you to. At the moment you can only see probably three or four of them. That's all we can pick up on for now. But this is the Voyela pride. And um, within this group, I think there's five males and one female. They're a very interesting dynamic. I mean, obviously, our sort of um, go-to is that they are all natal to each other. So they're all, you know, brothers or brothers and sisters. Or they come from the same natal pride. Um, but it's very interesting um, to see a group of five males together along with a female. So that would suggest that she's probably one of their sisters. Um, but you know we've been sitting with them for a while now and uh, they've just been rolling over and stretching and not doing too much um, They probably will start getting going in the next hour or so, but we want to try and save some light and um, Figure out where those leopards are from from this morning and from you know last night um, But these guys are garnering themselves a bit of a name as far as taking down giraffe is concerned and um, Probably about a month ago. We were watching them eating a giraffe, which was good fun Unfortunately, they're not doing that today, but uh, who knows, maybe tonight they'll come right, they'll take down a giant giraffe, and um, we'll be able to show that to you, but uh, I'll get our hopes too high, but it would be amazing. But yeah, I'd say that the males are probably in the region of about four years old, they're not quite challenging yet, they're not quite roaring yet, uh, they're not trying to take territory yet, uh, so they haven't placed any pressure on our Nauru males, which are closer to Tandatula, or they, they live closer to Tandatula or the river pride females and their cubs. But of course, five males coming through an ecosystem can be quite a daunting thing for all the other lions in an area. I mean, if those five males, if these five males form up a, a coalition, which it looks like they are, um, you know, put it this way, the Nauru males are only a coalition of three. This is a coalition of five. It's not hard to do the maths on who's going to win that, um, that battle should it happen. And um, one of the sad things about lions and cats in general is they perform something called infanticide, which is the killing of young. So if these 
five dorks over here, for lack of a better word, do come of age soon and do start challenging the Nauru males for um, their territory, there's a good chance that the river pipe females will uh, lose their cubs uh, to these males. The reason why males do this is uh, in an effort to try and you know, sort of claim the females and by removing their youngsters from them it spurs on estrus a little bit quicker or, or heat a little bit quicker and so the females will become fertile uh, a lot quicker than, whether, than if they had youngsters still with them and that'll then allow the new males, the, the imposters, the usurpers to mate with those females and uh, sire their own young with them because of course their genes are better than your genes and that's the egotistical way of male lions but Nice to see them lazing about you. It was definitely uh, worth coming to see them. I haven't seen them in about a month, I say, uh, so I say, or, or, or so I say. Um, so yeah, cool to catch up with them. They're not a pride we see very often. So yeah, there they are, the Voyella pride. But uh, let's save some life, let's save some time. Let's start heading back towards the east and see if we can come right with those two leopards. Right folks, it's, it's been a long day. We have enjoyed the lions. We've been trying to get back to the leopards, but when two baby hyenas pop out, um, or when you drop things that may... <laughs> anyway, when two baby hyenas pop out and uh, say good evening, you kind of just stop and appreciate them. They're one of the sweetest creatures you can come across. So from me, I'm going to say we're going to put the leopards on the back burner for this evening. We're just simply not going to get back there in time uh, for this evening's light. So, you know, you've got to take the good with the bad when you're out on safari. And, you know, sometimes plans don't fall into place. Today we had a plan. Um, this morning we really wanted to show you all those beautiful leopards that we saw last night again. Uh, thank goodness we got a bit of footage last night of that leopardess coming down the tree, which was amazing footage on Brit's behalf. But, um, you know, it just sometimes uh, days on safari don't um, go to plan, as I say. Um, so it's been a bit of a frustrating day and um, you know this is just the perfect way to round something like that off to bring it back home and just to get you to appreciate um, the bush for what it is you know nature for what it is you know don't rush so quickly that you miss all the beauty um, going past you um, so yeah we're gonna spend some time with these two little guys there were a few more of them that I'm sure will come out and about and fiddle around but um, you know hyenas are right up there with some of the best animals um, that you can hope to see while on safari. Let me just move so we can get them in frame and me, although they're much cuter than me. So, you know, I don't mind if you don't look at my face, rather focus on the cutie pies uh, flopping around behind me. Um, but yeah, you really do have to just stop and appreciate things that happen to you while out on safari. And these guys just popped out at the opportune moment to cheer myself and Brit up. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, my friends. It's a little bit hard to age these two. Um, you know, I've always struggled with hyenas and aging them and so on, but I'd say they're no more than about four or five months, maybe six months now. So they're getting quite big. Um, their den is just over here underneath the road. Um, so, you know, they've got quite industrious mothers. Um, and remember, hyenas are a lady power species. They are, they, they rule by matriarch. Um, so the, the males are very lowly considered within hyena society. And so what I'm getting at is their moms have, or, or their mom, has found a, a, a perfect uh, place to den, a safe place for them to den and to keep them safe. And you'll probably find that these two hyenas here are from the same mother. Um, females only give birth to two cubs at a time. And we do call hyena babies cubs, by the way, just like lions. They're cubs. They're not puppies. They're cubs. And if you remember a bit earlier when I was showing you the leopard track and the hyena track, and I said to you that, you know, if you want to be pedantic, Hyenas are actually more closely related to cats by that much uh, in comparison to dogs. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to understand why we call them cubs as opposed to, uh, to puppies. Uh, but yeah, the females only give birth to two cubs at a time. In fact, she only has two teats to suckle um, two cubs at a time. Um, it's just a way of um, ensuring that mom isn't overburdened um, by the situation, by having too many of them. And it's also from what I've, I've, I've read in studies and so on, they, the theory is that it maybe um, produces quite a competitive nature in the youngsters. And being a hyena is a very competitive thing to be. Uh, you're constantly having to compete for what you want to eat. You're constantly having to compete with other hyenas, lions, leopards, you know, everything around you. So this whole um, idea of competition starting from the day you're born is a pretty good uh, route to take or a pretty good strategy to take. 
Um, as I'm looking at these two now, there's a third one coming in. So that would indicate that there is um, more than one female. And I'm sure he'll come this way eventually. But these two are so cute anyway. So we'll wait for the third one to come into frame. But uh, yeah, there would probably be more than one uh, reproductive female within this clan. And uh, hyenas do organize themselves in clans. Um, so not a pride, not a troop, not a pack, a clan. And as I said, those clans will be led by a matriarch, by an, an all-encompassing female, a boss lady, if you will. Um, funny enough with hyenas, or, or interestingly enough with hyenas, uh, that, that whole matriarch and uh, or female versus male situation is... It's very interesting. The females are actually bigger animals than the males. And that, that happens straight from, from birth just about, where the males start getting dominated by the females. And that happens throughout their life. You know, the males are always much smaller. I wouldn't say much smaller, but, but smaller in general. Um, and it even goes one step further. You know, for the longest time, people used to believe, um, even scientists would believe, um, you know, before correct studies were done, that hyenas were hermaphroditic, which means that they carried both male and female genitalia. Um, that has since been disproven. And what we've managed to uh, ascertain is that a female hyena actually has a pseudo penis. All right. So the idea behind that is to give them even more dominance over male, over the males. They're bigger. They've also got a, a pseudo penis. Um, so the whole thing is, is revolving around this dominance hierarchy that we find. Um, Sadly, though, and um, this is quite an interesting piece of, uh, of information, but sadly for hyenas, they also have one of the highest mortality rates during birth within the predation or the predatory uh, world. And that's because the female actually has to give birth through that pseudopenis canal. And that's a very painful, very um, excruciating thing to go through. And if she can get through that first birthing... <laughs> Hi, Pip Squeaks. <laughs> but if she can get through that first birthing... Apparently things get a lot easier for her down the road, um, so it does get easier and easier with each litter that she uh, gives birth to. But uh, <laughs> I'm going to keep quiet now, let's just watch what these guys do. As luck would have it, it's starting to rain on our little hyena paradise sighting, which we've thoroughly enjoyed this afternoon. These little pipsqueaks have been putting on a great show for us, but I'm sure you can hear the drops coming down now. Reminds me of that wild dog drive we did a few days ago. But, um, yeah, I think we're going to be leaving our hyenas here for this evening. Um, it's been a wonderful sighting. I hope you guys have really enjoyed catching up with some baby hyenas. They really are one of the true joys of uh, the African bush. And as I say, don't be too quick to judge hyenas. They really are an amazing animal with great social bonds and family systems. Hopefully you can hear me talking over the rain. But, um, yeah, it's been very special. Um, I think this was worth it in comparison to finding a leopard. Uh, we really do like showing you guys the big cats, but we also really enjoy showing you all the small things that Africa has to offer. All the small things that Mother Nature serves us up. And um, judging by your feedback, you guys really seem to enjoy that as well. So we're going to keep that coming your way. We won't forget the big cats, I promise. Uh, but some days the cats just uh, are a little bit frustrating and they don't play the game. Um, but we're going to take uh, take the knock on the chin and we're going to still be pretty happy about the baby hyenas, the lions. And, you know, we saw some cool giraffes this morning. So it's been a good drive, guys, and I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed this day in Africa. And uh, I hope you have a great morning, a great evening, a great lunch, a great dinner, wherever you are. Enjoy Sofa Safari. And please don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, all those things. We love your feedback and we love getting back to your questions. And uh, don't forget, one of my questions from this morning was how big do you think a giraffe's heart can get? All right, I'm not talking about dimensions, I'm talking about weight. Either pounds or kilograms. I'll be happy with it. So, yeah. Anyway, the hyenas have ducked underground. Uh, I can see Britt's face right now. She's not enjoying the rain. Okay, sweetie. And uh, so, yeah, we're going to call it quits on the hyenas and we're going to drive away from this big rain cloud. Uh, we still have a bit of light. So if we do see some things on the way home, we'll definitely stop and show you guys. But uh, yeah, 